talks about passion between the women and the men. Chris Dyer and his creative friends, darling. Ooh, 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 Welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super fun, awesome YouTube show where you get to uh, hear nice conversations between me, Chris Dyer, and my awesome artist creative friends. Today, my guest is Jason Botkin. Jason Botkin is a super awesome artist, a Montreal staple in the street art community and so much more. We're going to learn so much about him. How are you doing, Jason? I'm good, Chris. I'm good. Yeah. Good to have you. So stoked to be here. We're in your studio in like, well, where are we? Well, we're in just kind of just the east section of Montreal. Like Oshlaga? Um, I think this is Oshlaga Maisonneuve. Nice. And this, this building, what is this building? It's called the Grover Building. It's right next to what used to be the, um, the Montreal Baseball Diamond. Okay. Which is just a, literally a, a street over. And uh, so it's so just historically a, a big... Um, Part of the Shmada industry of Montreal, the clothing and fabric. So this the whole building when I first arrived was filled with with thousands of tons of, of fabric on rolls, essentially. Wow! Like yeah. how long ago did and you arrive? So here? this would have been this would have probably been some sort of sewing facility on the on the spot we're standing. Nice. Well, you before we we turned on the cameras, I asked you how much is this big, nice studio with high ceilings and big ass window. You told me three hundred bucks. That's crazy. How how does that happen? Like, how long have you been here? Um, I've been here probably for about the better part of fifteen years. Fifteen years. Yeah. So it's just rent control locks it down. It's a little bit more than three hundred bucks. Yeah. Now it's still. closer to like three hundred forty bucks, but it's still a great price. Well, in American, it's not even three hundred bucks. I think. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And then you know, historically, one of the things that happened with this building is, I mean, it was one of the the was one of kind of considered the classic Montreal artist studio buildings. Uh -huh. It was slimy and you could come all times of the day and people had crazy parties here. Nice. Um, and then it got zoned for um, some sort of com commercialization or I think zoned for residential. They were going to turn it into condos. Okay. And there were protests by the artists. Artists had protests for weeks and weeks and weeks. Wow. They went out and closed down the street and did all sorts of stuff, and they got that they they didn't fight back the the the, the change of hands. I mean, the, the building eventually did change hands, but when it changed hands, the new owner decided to let um, to let the residential zoning slide and keep it for artists. Nice. So protesting works sometimes. I think it absolutely does when you do it intelligently. Nice. I'm with a purpose. So I, I, that's what something I really like out Montreal. I, I don't know if it's like a French thing, but when something, when people are not happy about something, they go out and protest till they get their way. Yeah. So the people do have some degree of power against the powers that be. They keep on changing all these raw rules and laws on us. And uh, we'll get into more of that, that topic soon. But I, I was, first I want to learn more about like you yourself. Uh, where are you from originally and, uh, you know, where did you study and how did you get to Montreal? Um, I'm originally from Denver. I uh, grew up there until the age of five, at which point I moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, so, I mean, I kind of have this funny dual citizenship, this sort of dual relationship to the United States and Canada, which is increasingly polarized in, in the political climate that we're experiencing right now. but Although I have that, I self-identify as Canadian mm -hmm. through and through. I've lived here most of my life. Uh, went to school, went to art school at a border college of art and design out in Calgary. I think simply for the fact that it took me closer to the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to go professional as a snowboarder back then and ended right up away. going to art school almost as a kind of good excuse to go to Calgary. Okay. Like, Mom and Dad, I'm going to school. Uh -huh. For a semester, and then I'm gonna fuck off to the mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if I should swear. Yeah, yeah, um, swear. Fuck it. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> you open the can of worms. Yeah. The the uh, 
and so the you know the experience was pretty transformative right away. I mean, the very first day of art school uh, kind of was the very last day of my professional vision to become a snowboarder. Yeah, a snowboarder. Wow, that um, radical. Yeah, it was really intense. It was really intense, and and then so four years of that, and then gave it up completely for almost a decade, and then got back to it um, after having moved to Montreal with my first child and my and my sort of young wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't sound right. I, I mean, we weren't married very long, but in this sort of emergent relationship, and uh, ended up here. Wow. Making out, ended up getting divorced and, and then saying, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And got back to making art in a very serious way. When you moved to Montreal, you moved for your wife then, who was a Montrealer? Or? Well, we, we had been living in Japan for a couple of years, for almost two years. Wow. Um, she, was, she was teaching English. I was, I was engaged in an apprenticeship with a local ceramicist. So we lived near Nagasaki, and, and it's prized for its porcelain okay. production. So I was learning this kind of interesting tradition of, of porcelain ceramics uh, with a very famous ceramicist in Japan, and just kind of generally messing about. We got pregnant. Had we not, I think I would have ended up in India, um, following the passion of meditation pretty wow. seriously. Beautiful. Um, but we ended up coming back to Winnipeg and having the baby and, and then we stayed for a year in Winnipeg. At that point, my mom and her husband had already moved out to Montreal and we visited them for, for Christmas and then fell in love with the place. Nice. Yeah, moved next year. And now you've been here for like, what, <laughs> 20 years or something? Yeah, a long time. How you like Montreal? Like, what, why do you stay in Montreal? What does, why Montreal and why you stay here? Well, there's always been an important family connection. And while I, I, the city still feels, I still feel a stranger to the city in a funny kind of way. I've been here longer than I've been in any city in my life. But um, it still is a kind of home, not home. Mm -hmm. It's been a temporary space um, that's been, you know, persistent for quite some time. But I love it as a home base. Mm -hmm. I, I love the culture of Montreal, the kind of the cultural tension between the Anglo, the Anglo and the Francophone spheres of of activity. Um, I, th I think Quebecois culture in general is one of the most passionate and fiery and interesting of Canadian cultures. Mm -hmm. And certainly if we, if we think internationally about the Canadian representation of culture, um, Francophone culture is one of those things we recognize as being really, really quite important rel and, and, and relatively um, uh, clean relationship to most Canadians, high 57 kind of composure. And most of us don't really say like, oh, I'm, I'm this or that. I'm some, like, I'm partly Irish and kind of a mix of Danish and, and whatever. I mean, it's, and people sort of lose touch with their cultural heritage and histories. Mm -hmm. I'm rambling on. So. <laughs> You're just so smart sometimes that... <laughs> There's some of your words, Heinz 57, that I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> like the ketchup. <laughs> Just a blend of like 57 ingredients. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, you, you were telling me you lived in Japan. How was that? Japan was pretty remarkable. It was, a, it was a, a very interesting time. A time of sort of dysfunctionality in the relationship I was in. Mm -hmm. And a time of being kind of... Um, lost in the bubble of a new universe mm -hmm. and it's it's magical it was a it was a magical time we studied calligraphy okay wow beautiful. um aside from the ceramics activities i was doing mm -hmm. the ceramics kind of sucked like it was it was fun but it was as you would think a japanese apprenticeship to be like i mean he he had me kneading clay for weeks and months at end on end i mean that's all i did it's like a Miyagi situation. Kind of like a, like a wax on, wax off, sand on, sand off type thing. It was all day kneading clay. You were whacking oh. off a lot? What? Yeah. <laughs> he would come in and cut the clay with the wire and he would look for air bubbles. And, by the, and, and he would come in, like he came in every day for a week and no air bubbles. And he's like, okay, now we're going to move on to something else. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 
Cool. It was pretty intense. It was weird. It Sounds was like a very disciplined experience, just like that culture is, huh? Yes, absolutely. And, yeah. Nice. And then you moved to Montreal. And once you were in Montreal, like, do you get into fine arts and get into the gallery scene? Yeah, when I got to Montreal, I wasn't making art. I mean, just a little bit. I was I was keen on the idea of returning to the, to that practice. Uh, Montreal felt like a great city, and it was, in, in, in fact, at that time, a really great city to do so. Studio space was cheap, rent was cheap. I mean, everything was really pretty bohemian here. Um, what year is this? 2000 and I think 2001. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's around the same time I arrived in Montreal. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I was working all sorts of jobs. I was, you know, I had this new kid, a one-year-old daughter, and we, and then soon we got pregnant. And I was working on these jobs, um, like in a framing store and construction and renovation. And one year I taught myself over Christmas holiday, like Photoshop and Illustrator. And I would just do anything I could to make money. Um, but then in 2003, after I got divorced, um, it became like I had a lot more time in shared custody to do my thing, and, it be, and there also became there, there also kind of arrived this really important reason to make art that was beyond just me doing what I do in the studio or whatever. But now I had there was no chance of failure. Now I had these two kids with me. The kids kind of like give this fire under your ass where there's no fucking around. You got to make your projects work, whatever you do. Right? Yeah, it's like a greatly increased gradient of responsibility. So yeah, there's no fucking around. And so that was it. I mean, I started making art most of often in this studio, most of a gallery based type of works, like works you could bring to a gallery. I had the first gallery show that I did here. I rented a space near where you live on Duluth. Okay, yeah, you did Gallery that. Gallery Cozen. That, that one that's, uh, oh, it's Duluth? Duluth and what? Like, oh, I don't know. Like close to the park. It's okay. a framing store. Okay. So I rented the space for the week. It cost me 600 bucks to rent it. Uh huh. And I sold the whole show out. Within, no way. Within a week. Yeah. Cool. And then kind of had some money from that and bounced to the next project and to the next project and, and then ended up in the old port at one point showing some some new works I was I was I was working on to a, a gallery that closed right away. I don't know what happened to them, but they were like, we're pretty interested, but no thanks. Um, and then randomly saw works of a friend in the gallery across the street, which was Tanger. Mm -hmm. Walked in, they asked to see the work that I had under my arm. I showed them and the relationship started from there. It was through Gallery Panger who gave me a couple of shows. I mean, they were a very young gallery. We could do whatever you wanted in that space. Um, that we ended up doing, um, I mean, they basically gave us the keys to the gallery for four months. When I, I mean, Tim Bernard and I. Okay. And we'd been talking about all sorts of stuff. We'd been talking about creating a project with American Apparel. Okay. Um, Which is a Montreal-based brand. A Montreal-based brand, and Tim is an incredible illustrator, uh, and and so he and I were hanging out. But I mean, he was essentially busking on the streets of Montreal. Busking? What was he doing? Selling T-shirts and shit like that. He was getting okay. T-shirts from um, the thrift store and and drawing on them and on pieces of paper and stuff, and then photocopying. Did he those sit papers outside and, of Mont Royal? Yeah, Metro Station? that's exactly it. Uh, that's yeah, exactly that. what he's doing. So we came up with this concept of approaching American Apparel to say, give us some t-shirts. Mm -hmm. And then that would supply us with this great material and everybody wanted American Apparel t-shirts, but they were expensive for us to sort of buy up front and then try to sell them at this, at this, at this space. So anyway, they give it, the Panger gave us the space, went back to Tim and I was like, we could do whatever the fuck we want in that space. And, and then right away we, kind of turned the American apparel idea that we had that we had sort of proposed this whole project, performative project to them, and we turned it into the En Masse project very quickly, very organically. And then that kind of exploded almost immediately, this network of people that we were connected to in Montreal, mm -hmm. uh, across intentionally across many different kind of 
what year, lines of what, click. What year was that first in mass? 2009. 2009. <laughs> so yeah, like 11 years ago. That's how I met you, right? That's right. Right. That's so, right. Uh, you invited me to... You, invi you. How many artists were in that first in mass show that you There did? were 30. 30. There were 30 that came. You kind of like decided yeah. the 30 best artists of Montreal of different no, genres? No, not the 30 best. It was like the 30, 30 artists that would perhaps best represent the, the, the genre of art that they were doing. And, and I say that really loosely, like, right. you know, like maybe that guy, one, that guy from this crew and this person from that crew and this guy's an illustrator and this person's a tattoo artist. Right. Best is it, maybe a sub subjective relative term, but basically you were going from tattoo artist to graffiti to comic books and you were trying to get like the gems. Like, once again, best is relative to the observer. But those things that interested you guys and... The, yeah, we were trying to capture those that we felt stood some fighting chance of collaboration. Mm -hmm. That within their own communities, sort of, as from what we saw, either A, we just loved their work, or B, we saw that they were themselves interested in the building of community. Which was what the Elmas project was really all about, it's, it, and it continues to be. It's about shared creativity and building communities through effective communication. So the, 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 the notion in that case is like, what happens? It was less a statement and more of a question, an experiment. Like what happens when you stick a bunch of artists, each from well-known crews and cliques and, 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 and avenues of art, each with some sort of notoriety on their own, into a room at the same time and you get them to collaborate? And and do you have to set some rules? And one of the rules we came on pretty early was like black and white, realizing the way you use color is totally different than the way that the next person does. Right. You mash, mash Chris Dyer next to Jason Botkin. The two may not work out. I but think if in our case it would. It, but. It, it has it successfully in the past. But, you, you, you know, but we could take that not. to a, a greater extreme, right? right? And the question being, how do you homogenize two really different voices like that? And the black and white does that. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of driving question was, could you, could you expand on the community of artists, especially from within the underground arts network or the urban arts network? And um, could you bridge that gap? And could that gap, having successfully bridged in the gallery situation, could you raise the public profile of that type of activity? Right, because it's all into, these lowbrow arts. Well, into something beyond what is too easily dismissed as pedestrian or lowbrow. Mm -hmm. Into a gallery in the old port, which is classy or observed as classy. Into a space with some legitimacy of critical dialogue around it. Mm -hmm. It was. It was. It lacked all class. It, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, our. Good our good to me. I mean. It, it, it had the veneer of class, but I mean, it was a space where we could really. I mean. We fucked around in that space as hard as we could, mm -hmm. and it, and it afforded it was just like they trusted us enough, and they kind of could see where we were going. But I mean, we were more interested in creating a really ripping party, mm -hmm. not because you know than having a kind of like a, a high cultured art moment of conversation, because those moments don't happen in that setting. Right. You know, you go there to party, and you go there to celebrate and have a time and make connections and meet people from different crews that you might not ordinarily meet, like get outside of your bubble. Mm -hmm. and, and for us to do so meant that, you know, in that conversation with Tim initially was like, if we successfully can do that, if you can host that quality and kind of conversation, then could you potentially not are you not then, as a community, making more noise, like mm -hmm. making work of a better quality? Right. Because you're supported by your peers. Yeah, you're magnifying, amplifying each other, which means that you're drawing attention from a larger public sphere of activity to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that was that, you know, like we started going down to Miami. But first, you know, let's, let, let, part, let's finish yeah. in this, this one party. So that one party <laughs> and show was actually so successful you thought it was going to be like a one-time thing to see what happened but it was so successful then then we wanted to repeat it and then it grew into its own movement that's been over a decade now that in mass is a thing and such great things have happened not only in montreal but all around the world 
and, uh, and it's all black and white. Uh, as you yeah. said, as a unifier, but Tim Bernard's art's very black and white. Were you doing black and white art at the time, a little bit? I was, but mostly in charcoal. I used charcoal and mm -hmm. the cheapest paper I could find because I was interested in that kind of work, like work that, of an ephemeral nature. Right. Work that had no intrinsic value, so to speak. And that first party also, I remember the walls were covered with uh, cardboard paper as to be able to not ruin the walls. But after that, it kind of became a thing where like, it mass has to be done on a real wall or, or wood or something real street art, you know, not just paper. So it transmuted from there too, right? Well, yeah, that's a, I'd forgotten that part. We, we worked on that paper with the intention, because we wanted to do panels, it, like cover the whole space in something nicer, like wood panels. And, and, and then ultimately, if these panels worked out, you could kind of take them apart and sell each one of them. Mm -hmm. So there was a monetization in there. I mean, right. this is kind of, um, there, there, there had to be some sort of commercial endeavor attached to it in some way. Somebody's got to pay that rent. Well, yeah, but the, you know, we, here we were in Montreal trying to apply to all the, the uh, Canada and Quebec Council grants, totally unsuccessfully. I mean, there just was no appetite for what we were doing. There was only a couple of galleries in town that that would even remotely work with us. And even then, our chances of success weren't entirely great. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, fuck it. Like, what does it look like if we take the driver's seat? Could we get into a relationship with someone like American Apparel where we go into their flagship stores around the world, we invite a bunch of artists from that direct community, to come in and use these blank shirts as a canvas to just create on. And then at the end of it, you have a big party. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets to talk about the successful intersections between big business and, and, and the supporting of the art. Mm -hmm. We get to have this, com this conversation about mutual advantage as opposed to opportunism and parasiticism. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, we thought it really interesting on that point, and it was successful. Like it was, we launched it for Nuit Blanche, which is the big kind of overnight art party of Montreal and, and internationally. And then it kept yeah. on growing to the point where, like, not only galleries wanted you, but we we ended up as in mass in the <coughs> Montreal Fine Arts Museum in a gigantic room. Yeah. For me, that's like one of the most prestigious places where I've painted on the wall and that was yeah. crazy like how many yeah. artists did that one well that's what i was going to say was that that very first night of opening stefan Antin, who was the um the um head curator had the contemporary curator at the museum of, of, of fine arts um he came and saw the show and and wanted to he wanted the museum to acquire the entire piece oh yeah he wanted to and buy he all the well, yeah and he presented to the acquisitions committee three separate times Okay. And each time they were like, no, we don't know what to do with this. Yeah, it's but every good. time, with his support and Nat Nat Natalie Bondil, um, it was only a matter of time before we worked with the museum. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, our mass project had really splintered into four different activities, very organically. But there was that so gallery and museum type stuff, festivals and public events. So we kind of started touring with these outfits like Oshiega and music festivals. Um, private and corporate commissions. Remember one of our first kind of corporate commissions was like $2,000 with Jimmy Lee, mm -hmm. which was part of Sid Lee's kind of outfit, a really local and very famous advertising corp company. And we just thought it was like so much money at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then pedagogical. The sort schools. Of mentorship programming right. so that we would go around. And that, that for me is the most important aspect of the En Masse project is that kind of aspect of... Um, talking to people specifically about shared creativity. Right. What that means and what that looks like and how that changes our lives. Yeah, getting kids and non-artists to paint with us artists on the wall all together and it's special for them to get all creative and and uh, yeah, mentorship as he said. It's, it, I, I love that part of Enmas and I kind of yeah. miss it because it's been a, a minute since I've done an Enmas jam and I hope uh, there's more to come in the future. But uh, Oh, you're on the road. We're both on the road quite a bit. Right. I've been on the road for like a minute. Even on that first in mass, I remember I didn't get to jam with all of you guys together in that room because I was out on California or something. And I only got in the end and did some things on the wall. And 
I made it in, but it was like the last one to participate. So in mass, if you, it's not really a crew. It's not really a collective, even mm -hmm. though it does collect a bunch of like how many artists have participated in mass? Over a hundred by now. Not so only from Montreal, 300. but three hundred internationally from, from yeah. around the world. We even gone to yeah. like Miami. Uh, when when was the first time we did Miami Art Basel? Like two thousand and eleven, and we were doing stuff for that mm -hmm. uh, that art fest from New York. What was it called with the scope? Not not scope. Well, we did something for scope. Oh, fountain. The fountain. The fountain. Yes. Right. Yeah. We were doing stuff with them. But then we also scored this big wall in a ghetto there in Wynwood, and it was just yeah. like awesome. And all these like big like Gaia jumped on, and all these other big artists were jumping on the wall, and we did a giant and mass mural. And for me, that was I wasn't even a street artist then. I wasn't even spray painting. So for me to paint a giant wall with all my homies and all these other street art stars was like, wow, like such a nice you know ramp into like street art and all that stuff. And for me, it was special. Mm -hmm. And uh, by now you've done like what? You've done uh, murals in China, in Mexico. What else? Where else has in mass painted beautiful things? Uh, all over the place. Anywhere where I travel, mm -hmm. which is quite a bit as well. I mean, it's, it's really... Uh, um, it's all over the place. And, and, and it's not really even necessarily... It doesn't even belong to me in that sense. I mean, there are increasingly communities doing these unmasked projects on their own, right. which, I, which I really love. And then simply acknowledging that it is related to the kind of the mother project. It's not mm -hmm. the, are they feel affiliated or is it just the same concept but without using the name? Well, like in Chicago, I mean, there's a, there's a group of guys that are old unmasked participants and they'll put together unmasked jams. Oh, cool. And I, they don't ever, they don't tell me about it. I mean, they'll call me up and, and send me pictures in the middle of. Oh, cool. And they'll be like, we're fucking around. Nice. Yeah. And yeah. so it should be like a, just like a general initiative that yeah. could happen anywhere. And they invite new people and they, they always make it really festive. And, mm. and, um, and then they put, the, they put the logo on there. Oh, or yeah. just they put, you know, put a little hashtag. Nice. And, and so it's always, it's always done with this sense of respect. That's there's a relationship that's that's developed there, but it's um, you know something I would love to see is increasingly people just continuing with that type of process, right? For no other reason than um, that process itself is the most po powerful aspect of the project, right? I and mean, forget about the final product. <laughs> Totally, like just uh, the the being together in community making art. Like I loved in mass, and I was participating in the first bunch of jams you know which was always just for the fun of it and not a job and then eventually some money came in and it was nice to like you know make some money while you're painting with your friends but what i liked about in mass was first i le i met so many of my artist friends in a mass jams you know like you get to like paint with kevin Ledo mm -hmm. or with disturbo and uh niguyen and just like all these artists that i knew about but i hadn't actually met because you just just not 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 a crossroads and then in a mass you're all together painting next to each other and he's like oh so that's how you lay your lines and sure. oh shit like what a cool style you got going and you have a conversation you exchange notes on how it's doing your career it was like amazing as a upcoming artist to be part of that project and I really appreciate it and I thank you for your efforts. I know like you got your own career to take uh, care of. So at some point you might have kind of like put in mass on the back burner because you were kind of neglecting your own, own art career and your own art that needed to happen. And maybe in mass has slowed down, but everything goes up and down. You might like, you know, take it back later and maybe take it forward. Um, are you proud about it? How do you feel about the whole project now 11 years later? You're right. I mean, the, the project does go on the back burner when I do my stuff. Uh, and that's an unfortunate sort of, and I, that's the bottleneck to the project is me. Um, moving forward with, with, you know, especially what kind of is, what's happened with COVID has been a real game changer, obviously, for everybody. What we have seen is the incredible systemic fragility of our societies and and at the kind of one of those bottom rungs of that activity is the is the cultural ecosystem which we've seen collapsing around us and so i think um especially with the en masse project 
there are a couple of solutions that are fairly straightforward that we're starting to explore rather re rather quietly at the time, um, but looking to create a marketplace, an online marketplace, whereby artists can start putting up their works um, really at sort of no cost other than just the amount of care and energy it takes to put up a nice post and descriptive about the painting. Maybe it's dead stock that you have in your studio. And, um, you know, a, a, a marketplace like that could be very successful if, 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 if we successfully co compound loop our social media channels to begin driving traffic to that place. But let's say someone buys your painting, plus the cost of shipping. I send the cost of shipping to you. You package it up, send it to the client. Client receives it and gives the green light. I send the rest of the money to you, minus 10%, um, which means that the artist retains 90% of their earnings as opposed to what we usually get is like 50% from galleries. You also get a contract in place that describes resale percentages owed to artists upon, upon resale of higher value than the original purchase, and all of those things in contracts that don't usually come into play. You also get a very specific introduction to the client so that you guys can go off and have the relationship that you want to have on the terms that you want to have. Right. But... Um, so it's kind of like a you know like that a ten gallery. percent allows me to onboard somebody to run that show right. So, so with a very kind of a skeletal framework, so it allows for us to take some you know to reposition ourselves market wise as a community, as an open sourced kind of you know decentralized form of artistic activity and trade within our community, driven by our community. Mm -hmm. um, it also allows us a, a place where we can gather forum in conversation specifically developed around professional issues that are arts related mm -hmm. so that you know if you are having trouble let's say finding work in your area <coughs> or you're going to a new area or you have technical questions on contract or legal issues and things like that we can ask each other inside the forum within our own community without having to go to places like Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram to kind of blast broadly our, mm -hmm. that information but we can sort of have conversation in very specific ways within our within the professional class of other artists doing this type of work. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to kind of I mean I think about it as as an artist survival guide to the new normal. So it's, it continues to the best of its abilities to be a community while still working somewhat like an online gallery but from friends that won't charge you too much. So you've worked with galleries What's what's the role of the galleries these days? Is the, the gallery system still working from your uh, opinion? I think galleries, like any like any brick and mortar institutions, are really struggling right now with the with the dawning of the new normal, with these sort of conditions of the uh, the pandemic. People can't I, go I to do, galleries. I don't go to galleries anymore. I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy socializing with a mask on. Um, I don't enjoy what's happened to our culture. I'm, I'm, I'm rather counter narrative on most of that stuff, and that doesn't make me, that doesn't make me entirely a popular popular conversationalist. Mm -hmm. You know. I'm just, what about before COVID? Well, I think galleries did have a position, but they were struggling. I mean, broadly speaking, money for artists is, isn't what it used to be even a couple of decades ago. Um, there's been impending financial collapse for quite some time. The writing's been on the wall. I think that's been a conversation I've been having for quite, for quite some time within the cultural sector, especially within those occupying somewhat of a leadership class, is to say what steps are being taken institutionally to afford protection against economic disaster, which is the world's economy is imploding, which is exactly what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Fuck the COVID narrative. I mean, this is essentially economic reset right. by governments that have gone completely rogue and, and um, have really um, totally mismanaged the available resources that we have across uh, kind of all fields of activity. Um, we have to find ways of coming back into some healthy sense of community co-management of shared resource. 
artists um, when you say we? Everybody has to. The community. Of because what the shared resources are, money, the, the, the economy, the ecology, um, you, you, you know, social justice, the way that we share wealth amongst ourselves as a community itself. I mean, what is the social social care network? These are really big questions, they're really difficult questions. And when people have distant when people have been disenfranchised from those conversations, when they no longer are actively participant in shaping the way that their community is using the resources, shit hits the fan. Mm -hmm. It's nobody's fault but our own for not doing the hard work of, of making sure you clean up your own backyard and your own waters. Mm -hmm. Like take personal responsibility for yourself, for your spirit, for your growth, for your relationships to the earth and to, um, to each other, and then get into the streets and maybe do some protesting and stuff like that. But it has to start from the ground up. Yeah, you gotta and, live your and, life according to the ethics you want to see the world. To yeah, be I'm not a political animal, but I'm deeply interested in politics. Well, it seems like these days we all gotta have some uh, political consciousness or opinions. And I actually wanna like really deeply more get into that subject matter, but first I still wanna go into your artistic history. So Fru and Mass, which is kinda street art-ish because we're painting on walls, many times it's outside, we're starting using the cans. Is that how you got into street art? Do you even consider yourself a street artist? You're I definitely, definitely don't consider artist. myself a street artist, no. Um, Not a street artist. No, because street art was a period of time. I mean, it really was proper. I think we're really proper about it about what it was and is and isn't. Um, it was a period of time, there was a kind of a finite number of artists internationally that were involved in that activity. And it's, as an activity has come and gone, what, what one could then theoretically classify it now as is rather more difficult. Uh, one of the best shots that I've heard from a critical point of view is something called intramuralism. Okay. exploring that space between the walls of the gallery and, and the streets. Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, with that same, with the same ethos, that same sort of do-it-yourself aesthetic, mm -hmm. I'm saying a, a, a bit anarchistic, a bit, a bit kind of a culture jamming in itself, but... Um, Still working with the system, though. But not quite as rigidly bound to a system itself, like... I, I think that the problem with street art for me was that I don't didn't work exclusively in the street, mm -hmm. As, and so why would I claim myself to be doing that? Right. And most of my work wasn't illegal because I wasn't necessarily interested in what happened in breaking the law. I was more interested in saying, seeing what happened if I went and asked that guy if I could do something on his wall. Right. And in fact, the only way that we could make it work our worth our while production wise was sometimes to put a bunch of guys on at the same time. Mm -hmm. who could um, keep costs low. You could order pizza and, and production costs. And that was it. And people would come and do that. So l let's, let's not put you in a box of you're a street <laughs> artist or even a muralist, but you're painting murals out in the street. Yes. And, and w that came after in mass? Well, yeah, that did come after en mass. And there was a lot of people that were seeing my work within the context of the En Masse project and saying, hey, why, don't you, why aren't you painting walls like this? Mm -hmm. That for me was very, very comfortable with that, the idea. Um, and so the, I think one of the first times was probably in 2010, maybe, mm -hmm. in Miami. Okay. Uh, that was with Land, uh, or, I, or 2011. I, I don't remember exactly which year that was, but it was the one of those early year. years yeah. and started... Uh, painting down there, big walls, and then started getting my own commissions. Um, and then eventually got hooked up with Pangea Seed Foundation mm -hmm. and started actively producing f festivals, the Sea Walls Festivals with them and acting as participant artists internationally. So you, so. Like, you almost like jumped like tons of steps like real quick. You went from like, doing murals to doing huge ones to then directing street art mural festivals like how does that happen so quick uh you know like uh what's the jason botkin magic <laughs> jason that, Botkin that makes it that you can create a movement like in mass that brings the community to create magic uh and then go out and do these huge murals by the way like 
you don't only do murals because you're not even like doing spray paint. You're doing it with brush, which to me, it's almost like doing a mural with a hand tied to your back, materials speaking. Uh, why brush instead of spray paint? I mean, I initially found spray painting really tough. I think it's really, I think it's really fucking hard mm -hmm. to do it well. Um, like most neophytes to the subject, I mean, I just, it was, it was disastrous. The spray paint, the spray can in my hand was disastrous. So, mm -hmm. um, very unforgiving and, and very difficult to master. So, and also very expensive. And yeah, yeah and more and, than buying like 10 buckets of paint and mixing and, oh, out of a bucket, out of like a gallon of paint, I'll get I'll get way more use out of it than I would out of a out uh, of a same quantity of spray paint. But every time like you, you go to a new place, you, well, I use a lot of colors, and depends how many colors you use. Right, right. You could get blue, green, and yellow, and and then mix it up, and you could have like you know. That's all I do. Yeah, yeah. I get the primary colors, black and white, and then mix them up. So it's it's pretty basic. It's pretty okay. affordable. But even then, when you don't have that shit, especially when you're traveling. Um, you know, every, everybody's got paint in their garage. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's dad has a couple of gallons in the basement. You know, we're happy to bring it up. And, and you, can, you can really, it's cheap and available. It's, it's much less toxic. It's, 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 it has far, a, a, a far smaller environmental footprint. And I'm concerned with that shit. Mm -hmm. My lungs, the reason I'm coughing today is because we've been doing, um, we've been, painting a 10,000 square foot wall uh, with the Unmass project and primarily with uh, a paint sprayer, mm -hmm. using it as the drawing tool itself. And, um, oh, wow. Yeah, which is amazing. And spray paint. Wow. Uh, this, but the spray paint gets right into my lungs increasingly with exposure to it. Do you got a mask these days? Because I know masks well, are hard Well, masks to are hard to find. I don't have a mask. There's Nobody has cartridges anymore. I know. Nobody's got cartridges. Because it's, people bought them for COVID protection, which is just the height of insanity. Um, but there you go. There's no more masks. So, I, I mean, I know. What my about lungs the are artist and uh, us getting cancer? <coughs> That's like a real situation. Yes, um, it is. So, yeah, I, I love your murals, by the way. Like, some murals that you do are so huge, and I can't believe you did it with a brush. You just kind of grab, like, a giant brush, you duct tape it to, like, a broomstick, and you're just kind of, like, sketching this gigantic canvas, sometimes with different angles. And then, like, the audacity of it all is that you're so chill. You don't even post that shit on your Instagram. You just kind of do it, and it's like, okay, it's done, and you don't even share it. You're like, you're very not show-offy. <laughs> do you feel like you need social media in order to advance mm. it? It seems like you've done good in your career, and you didn't even need to use social media so much. You got any comments about that? Yeah, I think, of, I, I th I think for some years now, I've been rather terrified of social media in ways that don't, people are generally waking up to today. Um, I guess I saw the the warning signs coming pretty early. Uh, also, increasingly, on the environmental, you know, you know, sort of environment issues campaign, uh, and which led directly towards working with indigenous people, uh, especially here in Canada, First Nations communities. Um, the work became increasingly personal in nature, and and. So I've been extremely productive, but it found myself less and less interested in playing the game of social media, or more specifically being played by the platform itself. Because I could tell that there was some things that were changing in terms of the way that I was thinking about the work and what was happening in relationship to the statistics that Instagram was feeding me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did quite consciously think to not continue using it for a while and to see what would happen, like what would happen to my career. Could I continue to make art in ways uh, where I didn't enjoy public celebrity and attention, where I wasn't kind of accumulating more of a following. Instagram was a huge tool for us, for me, early on in my career. It was giant. It's not what it was now in present time compared to what it used to be. The tool is no longer functional anymore against our favor um, for policies that are becoming are becoming abundantly clear and, and so I think that's why I earlier expressed a real interest in in recreating platforms which are more in our favor 
and not sort of being used against us. Um, so yeah, I continued to do a shit ton of work. I guess those who see it are those in the community. Right. And there's no wrong or right. I'm not, I'm not giving you shit, Jason. Yeah. I guess like, like at every time I see you, I'm like, why are you not posting these murals? This is insanity, you know? Like, and it's yeah. not about yeah. showing off and being like, hey, guys, look how cool I am and look what I did and look how great I'm doing. I feel that's medicine. As you say, you're working for native communities. Like, I would so love if your community, your followers, which includes me, hear about like your experiences with the uh, you know with these natives and what you did and what you failed like that is medicine that's fighting the pollution that as you say we're being pushed on in these social media if, if we're being surrounded by pollutions we get polluted so us the shamans the medican medicine makers it's almost like our responsibility to pass on our medicine may it reach a million people or free it, it doesn't really matter because it's our duty to share it as widely as possible with the technological sh tools that have been given to us. But I totally understand your frustration. I totally understand the bullshit in algorithms and how we're being convinced to see the world through a very a treacherous filter. Uh, I just want to change the filter. I want to change the filter where it's like, hey guys, this is a beautiful world. We're here to like make it amazing. Let's, let's do the work. This is what I'm doing. Let's all fucking stoke each other and and get this shit going. So do you think there's like, you know, in general on the street art muralist community to really like weave off the, the titles itself, but you know what I mean. These people who are out in the streets hitting yeah. big walls. Um, do you think there's something positive happening there? I'm sure there's negative things aspect happening too and we could focus on that, but do you think there's some good medicine shared in this revival of street art that's just reaching millions of people around the world uh, these last few years. Yeah, I think so for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's incredible medicine out there. Um, and and, and that, that, I think that's encouraging. I mean, that brings me a lot of joy. Um, it's, you've got to go out of your way to find it, but maybe not too far. I mean, I think that's the, the, the great blessing of social media is that it does lay bare and give access to all sorts of incredibly diverse peoples. Um, for me, the best of muralism, you, you know, contemporary muralism was really born out of Chicago in the, in the late 70s, uh, sorry, the late 60s, early 70s, mm -hmm. um, primarily within black communities who understood these as tools for emancipation. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as I, I hold that really dear to my heart in terms of understanding that art can be used and has historically in recent in recent histories, in fact, uh, and in, in present time being used as tools for emancipation. One needs to ask emancipation from what? What are we emancipating ourselves from and where are we not free? And I think those are ongoing and huge issues without no no. no Without never necessarily ever having to come to very straight conclusions on that, but I'm interested in the question itself, and um, and I see a lot of art very motivated by in an infinite series of expressions motivated by similar intent and interest, mm -hmm. is in you know sort of looking at truth and bringing that to people, and 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 art can be what it is. I think I have huge respect for what you do as an artist and in your practice because you do um, you have found ways of staying positive in ways that I've really struggled to overcome depression against and the real kind of a, um, a painful retreat into isolation and, and into places which aren't necessarily themselves healing mm -hmm. and so you know I really I always value you as as a kind of a model or role model and as somebody who is able to 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 uh, consciously use the tool to to help inspire people in, in very important ways. Well, I try but, my best, and I also get depressed, and I also get sad. And uh, but just so you know, and a reminder that I'm your friend, and I'm there when you need somebody to like just talk and get that uh, you know that sadness out if you if if you need and uh, and. Yeah, we, we've, we've all have bad times this year. We've definitely all gone through depressions and bad times. And 
uh, wrestling with our shadows, which I think is a very healthy situation if we kind of like ignore it and push it off and don't do that homework. It's like this year is like, no, you got to do the homework. You got to wrestle with that shadow. You got to deal with it because it's going to crush you eventually. So either learn to dance with it and accept the pain and then transmute it into hopefully once again medicine, something that can heal you and your community mm -hmm. through that self-healing process. Mm -hmm. And arts really saves our lives, you know, and, and, uh, and hopefully helps many others on the way. How's your health in general? Um, ups and downs. Ups and downs, yeah. Definitely ran into last couple of years, ran into, ran into quite an intense autoimmune condition. What's it called? Well, we don't know. I mean, the doctor oh. doesn't really know. So I work primarily with a naturopath. Okay. That's why you got and a knee brace, right? Yeah. It affected your knees? In a number of my joints. Oh. Yeah. So some probably in between somewhere like lupus and psoriatic arthritis. Okay. Wow. Did you have to but change your diet to improve? I did change my diet quite a bit. Uh, improvement is sort of comes and goes. What have but you it's tried? it's a slow process. Um, Quite a number of things over the years, but I mean, I primarily fell into a plant-based, plant-based diet routine, mm -hmm. you know, fairly strictly. So, so vegan, strictly so. Yeah, yeah, which I enjoy. I don't mm -hmm. mind it at all. Um, yeah, I do sustainable for the planet, uh, compassionate to the animals. It's all of the above. I think yeah. it's. I mean, it's a really healthy way to go, and you know, landslide of evidence if one needs that type of thing to. And it's helped support a little the position. bit. Yeah, it's helped a little bit, and that, and I think you know I think the other aspect of that is unpacking um, un unpacking some of the emotional spiritual issue around that type of thing. Right, but you've also been working with that through psychedelics, I believe. So well, to some extent, to mm -hmm. some extent, yeah, consciously so. Because I know you've been kicking it with my old friend uh, Karen St. Pierre. You told me last time I saw that you were hanging out with her. It's like, oh, I know Karen. I met her in Mexico 2006 yeah. uh, when I was doing a show in Cancun. So I was like, oh, my God, you know her. And you're going out to the country and uh, using natural medicines with her. And is it helping you um, turn pages in your uh, emotional development? Yes and no. I mean, I don't have that much experience to be able to say. And, and 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 to any sort of profound depth to be able to say, yeah, this is this is really totally helping in relationship to the conditions I experience today. Um, that being said, I mean, if it sounds stupid to say it. It's any sort of experience with plant mind consultation I find typically pretty enlightening. Mm -hmm. You know, comes with some pretty incredible learnings as long as I'm willing to shut up and listen. Right. Uh, what uh, what plants have you been using? Uh, I don't know how comfortable you feel about talking about your use of psychedelics or not. Well, I mean, mostly, mostly, mostly mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've tried ayahuasca. Uh, DMT is something that I'm pretty interested in. How many times have you done DMT? Well, I would say no, no more than ten times. Wow, that's more than me. What have you seen in that? place well that's a whole nother story that's like we start to film all over again <laughs> <coughs> tell me a little bit the f very first time that i did it it was um i mean anybody that will start talking about dmt tells you how sort of difficult it is to describe ultimately right. what the thing is and where it takes you um it's hard to believe there's a kind of a cognitive dissonance when you're sort of trying to reconcile with the idea of for a very temporary period of time, like a couple of minutes, strapping yourself onto a rocket and being taken off, you know, just being launched into the air. Mm -hmm. And just the intensity of, of the entire experience in terms of volume and wind tearing at your skin and all of those things. And that's what DMT is like. When you actually do it, it's it's like holy shit. This the very first thing that crossed my mind was, I've eaten the forbidden fruit. Right. And you've seen behind the veil of reality. You've seen behind the veil, and 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 there came with it a sort of a shame too, you know, like a a, a kind of a Christian remnant that that descended upon me and was like, why shame? Were you not allowed to see into the face of God? 
something along those lines. It was just, you know, <laughs> too good to be true, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it just it only continued from there. But it was very, um, it, it's it's very remarkable to kind of ha have to deal with things that in in day to day experience, like emotions, are very ephemeral, and you don't know how to hold on to them. Whereas opposed to in DMT world, they become solid like objects that can mm -hmm. be moved and repositioned, and work can be done internally on the body as you move things around mm -hmm. and become aware of of um, things that are stuck and blocked and, and, and need to make choices about some of those short-term and long-term, there's an incredible amount of, of information being downloaded, just a truly, unbelievably infinite. incredible, <laughs> infinite, but incredible, like incre almost, in, almost stretching the bounds of incredulity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the challenge is moving out of that space is one of integration. Right, bringing that vibe back to the physical plane. Well, yeah, and then you're sort of very stuck with the limitations of your mind. I mean, how well have you sharpened your mind through the, through the craft of meditation, through the practice of learning to still yourself and to observe? And so, I mean, it kind of goes back to that ultimately. Mm -hmm. The in phenomenon itself isn't probably that different from a biochemical point of view. You know, whether you cheat it with a drug, so to speak. I prefer to think of it as a plant mind consultation, mm -hmm. um, or you, or you spend the time breathing intensely, or you know Joe dispensing the shit out of it. Right. Um, you, you know the results are going to be are going to be parallel. So do you meditate uh, a good amount? I do. Well, yeah, I do. When time when time allows. <laughs> yeah. Every time I go go to to my ayahuasca retreats, she's always telling me like. When you go back to your normal life, make sure you meditate one hour a day minimum, Chris. If not, you're going to lose touch with us. You can't hear our voices. And if you want to get connected with, with the higher sense of yourself and us, you got to, you know, get on the phone and, and, and yeah. listen to us. Yeah, yeah. Do you consider yourself a spiritual person or do you have a particular path or religion or something that you hold dear to your framework of belief? Yeah, I grew up Christian. My dad's a minister, so Christianity was like was a big deal. That was the you know the flavor of that day. Um, as a younger man, I moved away from that into Buddhism and yogic studies, uh, which I pursued pretty intensely for years. Uh, got into Scientology at one point, mm -hmm. really intensely. How was that? Um, life saving at the time. Uh, really valuable. Um, it became something I couldn't live with. It became something that no longer fit at one point. So it's not part of my life in the same way. It's not that I'll take those tools that worked out mm -hmm. of my kit. They belong there, but it's it's. I just am not subscriptive to the to the church's practices and sort of process in general. Um, but again, that's great stuff and and. Yeah, I mean, I've been a meditator lifelong and sort of interest in those types of territories since I was a little child. Um, but it's not something I talk about that much. Right. You just want to be it and live it in your life. Um, you know, I just worry when you tell me like you're all kind of like depressed. I'm hoping that you you're still using your spiritual tools to help you navigate the, the tempest that's happening right now in the world that us spiritual warriors have to like brave through more than say people who haven't been preparing for these times. Mm -hmm. Like we knew this time was gonna come. That's why we've been doing our homework and here it is. Mm -hmm. And we gotta kinda like keep on swimming for our own sake, but also to hold space to those others who all of a sudden got caught naked in the middle of the situation mm -hmm. and don't have a lot of tools to uh, use in order to make through. And mm -hmm. A lot of people are very depressed and then, you know, the repercussions of this whole like you know society of covid uh, on people has been so much harder than the virus itself yeah. um so now i'm gonna give you a little bit of a of a space for you to tell me like how do you observe the world these days how do you um how do you say observe the state of the world in this year 2020 
what's going on from your point of view? And it, this is your personal reality. You, 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 you know, we're all just trying to find reality from all these different perspectives. So what's your perspective? Oh, we're going through a massive, we're going through massive societal changes. Uh, I don't know how articulate I could be in terms of shaping out that reality out. I think it's complicated. Um, I find it very, you know, in that point of sort of depression and, 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 and the sort of a darkness, uh, I would say that some of that is very intentional in terms of really looking at some of the root of, of what might be causing some of the social fragilities around us. Um, that's sometimes just depressing material in general, and yet something that's important to confront. Um, the mechanism by which you confront those things and not be constantly burnt or burnt out by that is something worth looking into. And certainly I can speak from both sides of that coin. Uh, certainly the side of saying, I'm learning how to take care of myself better through that process increasingly by the day. But I'm also aware of how it can also really just be soul crushing too, to a degree. And brings a lot of fights because sure you, you were telling me before that you stand with a point of view that's not a popular point of view. Well, it's counter narrative. It's right. counter narrative. The narrative of the mainstream. The narrative of the mainstream. So anytime you have a, take a position that's counter narrative, the, the mainstream acts accordingly, according to how it reacts in the day. The right the now, fun of you. today, because of this, because of so many of the issues that we've run into, much of the world around us is is crump like many of the structures and the institutional structures are crumbling apart i mean they're just they're they're falling apart so people don't know who to turn to in those times historically the main the, the sort of the mainstream media outlet has been that thing that glues everybody together uh right or wrong i mean it's just how the sort of the state works and, and operates we're also increasingly in a place where we see all around us reasons not to subscribe to the mainstream. And so it's a time of huge instability right now. I mean, everything is, everything is flipping upside down. There is also a huge opportunity to do something about that and to really get in there and make some changes and um, really start to... Re I personally am really taking stock of my value system in general right. and what I consider to be valuable, what I consider to be success, and rearranging that according to um, some of the new, new realities that are dawning on us. I mean, I don't think I'm going to travel anymore the way that I used to. I don't think that things are going to be that way for me. Mm -hmm. And it's really just reconciling with, that, uh, with those realities for me of saying, Am I willing to accept this new reality, this new normal, or do I find reason to, to resist it or push back on that point? Right. Do we fight for what we want, a world where we're free to travel the world with no BS, or do we flow with the experience, maybe an, uh, uh, a world where maybe the environment will get a break from less uh, flights or something? Sometimes it's hard to see what's the correct thing, because it depends on what angle you're seeing it and that's why I'm bringing this up not only to see your perspective but also to find some answers on like what should we do both as normal human individuals and as as artists how do we improve the situation it seems sometimes that we don't have like so much power other than just like correcting my life correcting my perspective my vibration being good being the best I can be sharing that love and then hopefully that goes through my art and bringing people up a little bit. But is that enough in a world where dark forces want to turn us into like enslaved robot kind of humans and, and stuff, you know? Which is one, an extreme of the, of the narrative on the other side, which seems very sci-fi and so pessimistic, people don't even want to touch it. But it seems to be like also a potential. How do we talk about it without getting depressed? And how do we fight it when it seems like they are holding all the cards? What do we do, Jason? Oh, man, I'm on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think Howard Zinn is somebody that talks about this kind of stuff, the responsibility of artists in the time of war, uh, quite beautifully. Howard Zinn? Howard Zinn. Yeah, yeah he's worth looking into uh, on that point specifically. And, and 
you know, paraphrasing very loosely, and he would say, the artist never has to really apologize for making something beautiful and pretty as, as it sort of offers this moment of transcendental experience to a person uh, in, in the midst of what's rather a harsh reality. Um, he speaks kind of broadly to issues of the transcendent function of imagination and that ability that art gives to people to imagine a future that's better than the one that we experience today, um, which speaks to some of those issues of depression and how we, how we look beyond what are sort of the doom and gloom of the situation. Um, some of the problems that are about to hit us, you know, straight in the mouth with some of the econo crushing economic realities coming down the pipeline as we reconcile with the debt that we've created and those issues. Um, so holding on to that is really important. And I think anybody that has the courage to make art um, is doing exactly that, keeping the spark of imagination alive. Right. And that's, and that's really fundamentally important. But Zen might go on to then say, but is that all? Mm -hmm. Is that all? And, and why do you have to be a specialist in any particular area? I mean, do you have to be a specialist in environmental science? to have a valid voice or concern about how the world uh, resources are being managed, for example. Right. Or can you, as an artist, take an opinion on that subject and go out and talk about it and be participant in how the sphere of public opinion is shaped, formed, and swayed? We as artists have the most powerful tool at our disposal in, in, in changing that culture of opinion that holds everything together. Mm -hmm. If you can change that, you can change anything about the world and about society. Right. And so we have the most powerful tools in doing that. And I think as long as, um, as, long as we find ways to remind each other of that power, then at least in times of need, we know that we can, we can, we can turn to our work as a way of talking to people about very complicated and very difficult and painful issues in ways that help us to think about those issues and, and see through towards solutions that are out of the box mm -hmm. and aren't, 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 easy to, aren't easy to navigate. And so that, I mean, it, you're, I, you're right. I mean, what function is art? What form is art in our world? Very little, and the same can be tr said about dreams. Like, what are dreams worth? When you, especially if you don't even remember them, let alone understand them, and yet in a clinical setting, if you're deprived of dreams, that REM state, you might have eight hours sleep in the night, but without that period of time, within two weeks, you'll go clinically insane. Right. It's important to stay sane and happy like regardless of the uh future positive <laughs> negative if we stay happy inside that's our reality and we only live in our individual realities are you optimistic at all about the future do you think there's even like a future where artists can keep on doing art or is the economic devastation going to be so bad that we're all going to just have to go and peel potatoes at the port or something I'm not terribly optimistic about the economic future and realities. I think we're in for some dark times. This winter will be hard. Um, and increasingly, we'll see things that are changing quite dramatically. Um, I'm optimistic that we as a community can, can continue to do good work. If resistance is needed in some area, then okay, well, that's possible too. What kind of resistance? Well, um, I think that, you know, taking the vaccine is a really special and excellent example. Not taking the vaccine. Well, do you have a choice? Well, resisting the vaccine. Do you have a choice in taking the vaccine? Or if you don't take the vaccine, are you in, are you in automatic self-quarantine? Because you're not somebody insurable within the social contract. Um, those are really big issues. Mm -hmm. um, some if if say, I if I subscribe to the allopathic system, medically speaking, um, you know, I don't think I I don't think I'd be in very good shape. I think I my body would be really fucking lost. I might have died already. <laughs> allopathic system is the normal medical system. Yeah, they just didn't know what was up. Um, from a natural path point of view, 
I mean, they're going to look at it from very, through a very different lens and come up with some very different conclusions. We're going to have very different conversations about immunity and about how to take care of the body and what to do to change it. My brother and sister are both medical professionals. One, my brother is the head of surgery at two of the biggest hospitals in Winnipeg. I mean, I know both sides of those coins. My side just tends to be alternative, alternative medicine, alternative thinking about the world, um, on a point of view that's rather critical of big pharma interest, period. Uh, and in the way that it's treated a lot of really alternative medical practice in general and suppressed it, even when shown beyond shadow of doubt to be workable. So I, I, I have a kind of ingrained sense of skepticism that I, that I keep sharpened. Right, like where's our options, you know, like I want to keep my immune system and, and my health by eating healthy, by taking my supplements, by doing exercise. Why do I need to be injected with something from, as you say, big pharma that's money for them and who knows if it actually works. They say it's going to take... Zero liability, right. zero accountability, zero accountability. and it's being fast-tracked. Right. So they want to do it in like a year instead of You don't of have to be years. an awesome student of medical history to understand that that might not be a super good idea. So those are those are questions. Be careful, people. <laughs> yeah, well, those are questions, right? And I think everybody has those questions. And perhaps they're best summated by a cartoon that I saw the other day that was this woman sitting in her doctor's office. And she's like, doctor, when is COVID going to go away? And the doctor's like, I don't know. Do I, do I look like a politician? Ah! <laughs> and so here we are again at this crossroads of figuring out how we as a community are going to co-manage our resources. And what's happening? And I think if you look beyond the mainstream, which should always be encouraged, right? I mean, we should always inform ourselves across kind of multiple news outlets, even the ones that make us uncomfortable, so that we can apply some sense of Socratic method to this, this the madness of this process, and start to say, "All right, I, somewhere in the middle here, I'm going to find some sanity to continue to operate today, and do what I do." and have some sort of meaningful conversation with other people today about what we're going to do if shit hits the fan so that we are not caught off guard so Wait, that what? we can say, well, you know, I think it's important to start talking with each other about what we do if, you, if, if Chris decides not to take the, the vaccine and you get locked down, how are we going to get food to you or are we just going to leave you there? You know, how, to what degree are we willing to sort of cooperate with the state in relationship to a friend who's decided not to take the vaccine for some obvious reasons, but is paying a very serious penalty for doing so? Right. You think like anyone who doesn't take the vaccine will be outcast? There's going to be regional specificity in application of how it's done in the United States. It's a military. It is officially a military operation. Mm hmm. I'd love to have a conversation, meaningful conversation with somebody about why that's the case. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that should be asked, and yet we don't ask those questions because we're terrified of something we don't understand. Right. It's a, it's a it's, tricky reality. It is a tricky, and it is a tricky reality. But what did we learn from the war on terror? A, it's paradoxical. War causes terror. So mm -hmm. how can you have? more war to stop terror. I mean, it's, 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 it's something, it's, it's, I mean, we as adults soak this shit up, but it's something we would tell children. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's balderdash. It's, it's utterly bizarre, the kind of, the, the shit that's spewed out of the mainstream media mouthpiece. And, and it is protecting politicians that have gone completely rogue, including our, in our own country. And um, and uh, it's complicated, and <coughs> it's never <laughs> quite so easy to sort of be dismissive of that stuff. We have to we we have to have conversations about how to decentralize from that. We don't need to use that money. We don't need to use those systems, and we may not always find them very comfortable to do so. So, how do we create alternative economies? How do we create them open source? How do we look into sort of, you know, bit chain, blockchain type currencies or gray and black market type territories where we can continue to survive, but 
if that means survival pit against the wishes of the state. And right now, especially if you look around the world, medical martial law is happening. Whether in many places, like around Australia. the world, Australia and New Zealand, our Commonwealth cousins, our brothers and sisters in the Commonwealth, Canada, perhaps not too far away, mm. but I mean, to to a very Machiavellian degree, it's not comfortable. And 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 I guess I I think quite, I I think quite intensely about the words of Thomas Jefferson when he said, "Those who are willing to exchange liberties." For protection, deserve neither protection nor liberties. You know, I mean, it's really, it's it, it comes down to that. History tells us that when we've forgotten some of those issues. We spoke about histories and ancestral knowledge a little bit before. Um, we've, we've forgotten about, we've been living in a time of relative peace for quite some time. And forgotten that uh, things are more precariously balanced than that. And especially when it comes to the economic resource. But as we all know, vote with your dollar. Maybe you don't use the dollar anymore. But if you if you, you wait until the last minute then, and you don't have those conversations, then you don't have those conversations and you're looking mm -hmm. around for people who might have answers. Right. And so, you know, the answer comes from big from Big Daddy. Or the, does the answer come from the community? And I would say that um, from my own political leanings, you know, the answer has to come from the community. Do you think trusting the government to do that stuff has not been a, 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 a tested, a tested commodity? Right. They, they say they always want to take care of us and then they're for us, but they always fuck us in some way. And then we're like, "Hey, government, why are you doing this shit?" And they're like, "Oh, sorry, next politician." But they always, <laughs> it's always so much corruption and bullshit. Well, we know the government is simply the shadow of big corporate interest. Right. I mean, that's They're spokespeople. Yeah. So we again. I mean, if that's the case, then it's very transparent. I mean, just use your money to, to vote against, vote against decentralization. Like, stop using their money. Stop. Like, let's stop using the kind of the the state stores like Amazon and Walmart and all that stuff. Like, go local. You know, do your thing. Um, we can continue to travel to the degree that we do. I think we're both quite nomadic as artists. It's my nature. Yeah, and it's an important part of our practice, but maybe we're not anymore. You know, I'm ready so to change if that's what it takes to, to make a world a better out. place. If the, but I don't want to stop traveling just because they forbade me and I'm a prisoner of my apartment forever. That's Absolutely. not something I want to like. That's not freedom to me neither. Yeah. Do, do you believe we should all just buy places in the country and start like getting out of the cities? Like the city's a dangerous place in a time when it seems like they're making human factories or something? No, I don't think there's any way to run away from this. Okay. Yeah, I think we just have to sort of stand our ground. Where's your home? Where are you at home? And that's maybe where you should be while we kind of recenter and, and, and and that's a that's not an easy question. Home is where you make it, right? It's a hard one for me because I love my apartment in Montreal, my community in Montreal, but then I got my parents in Peru with their land and their food, and I want to visit every year and be with them and have this land with food and sun where I would eat, like I could go there and live the rest of my life and I'd be safe and healthy, yeah. even if I'm locked in this acre. Yeah. But then I never see you guys anymore. And probably, you know, I'll never see a girl be in, anymore in my life. And, <laughs> and then I'll only see my parents and then see them die and then be by myself. And yeah. that doesn't sound that great neither. But also doesn't sound that great like stay in my small Montreal apartment every winter going crazy and not being able to like, you know, see the sun for half a year. Well, we got we to gotta say, I mean, the, the bigger question is, I mean, are we even going to accept those terms? I hope that something happens, man. I hope that something happens that we might not expect it. Like, there's doctors that are, are uniting. There's lawyers that are uniting that see through the bullshit, and they're going against the system, against the government. Like, there's a lawyer in Germany that's, uh, you know, suing Germany for crimes against humanity, all the people who are suffering from these lockdowns. There's doctors who are saying, like, hey... Uh, herd immunity is not a ridiculous thing. This actually is just nature and you guys are stopping nature. You're making it worse. Like listen to us, you know, professionals and not just listen to the doctors that work for the system and the corporations and governments and such. 
But yeah, we see everything through the lens of media, or a lot of people do. I just really don't like to see TV anymore, but it's, it's really hard to really find a true source of truth. And uh, yeah, it's a tricky world we live in, you know, and it's a tricky way to find how we fight it and find our own freedom. But at the same time, I just don't want to just like sit there and do nothing. And I guess part of doing this uh, podcast is, yeah, I want to showcase the art and magic of all these beautiful friends I got. But I also want to hear the perspectives of everybody and see if we can find some solution to uh, a potential negative future while knowing that a potential positive future is also there awaiting us if we just know how to vibrate it and attract it to our reality. But we really got to figure this out and we need this com conversation happening. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that signals the, the start. I mean, this, that, you know, the conversation is where it starts. And, 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 and finding out ways, I mean, the clever bit of, of that is finding out ways to have conversations with people you don't expect to have conversations with on a regular basis, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, and that's about growing community. That's about sort of finding ways of strategically getting away from your own bubble and, and, and the thoughts that you think and what you think you know and, and all those things and looking beyond that sphere of activity. Um, because you're right, I mean, we, we will... I mean, we make the bed we sleep in. And so what kind of bed do you want to make? What kind of bed do I want to make? I think ours is going to be different than, the, than what's mainstream. Mm -hmm. And so we just have to have that conversation realistically to say, here's how it feels and here's how we can make it, here's how we can continue to make it beautiful and creative and filled with life and art. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe it scales down for a bit. Uh, that would be appropriate to the situation, um, but it can't disappear. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it certainly, um, you know, I think we have to find ways of creating communities that can support us in our sort of counter-narrative positions. Uh, not necessarily from a position that they have to believe in what you do or subscribe to it, but at least can hold space for Just allow for you to think how you think without being attacked yeah. for being different. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Who knows where it will go? There are a lot of people waking up and the future holds just in infinite complexity and, and growth. And while I'm aware of the intensity of these feelings politically and, you know, with the big shift, um, I know that a lot if a lot of our ancestors have historically walked through that period of time, those hard times, um, and sort of come out ahead. But I mean, where we're headed right now is just so kind of exponentially unthinkable. Like the next 10 years will eclipse the last 100 years type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think that quite realistic. Um, so the changes, changes are happening very rapidly. Um, and who can say, you know, I, I, I am a little bit old fashioned when it comes to how I think about the world. Um, and maybe there's just not room for that. I mean, who knows, who knows sort of where we're headed and how we move there and what needs to happen in terms of our own kind of experience of life, um, in order for us to move off planet successfully and take the kind of the next stage of human evolution in consciousness. You said move off planet to another planet? Yeah, well, just start to really kind of grow our wings as a species. Mm -hmm. and, and we are, we're sort of moving towards that, we're throttling towards that territory. It's sort of the, the kind of the impending event horizon of a rendezvous with the digital super intelligence. And, right. um, you know, just the increasing kind of connectedness of our, of our, um, of our sort of our web of silicone as it goes around the world and is, 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 in, is increasingly just moving in this infinite kind of complexities, fractal complexities of, of, um, of manifestation and things are speeding up so quickly. And I mean, I, I, who knows? I, this may be. Everything may be happening exactly as it should. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. 
It's just sort of unfolding. It's just it's it's yeah. an interesting story. God just breathed creation and he'll pull it back at one point and he already ended all of creation and he's already chilling in infinity and eternity celebrating all he did and all the plots and ups and downs humans and every other alien planet on the galaxy has had and we're all just kind of like laughing about it and right now we're at an interesting point where like we don't know the future so we're all like oh my god what's gonna happen are we gonna all turn into a bunch of cyborg robots you know with microchips and vaccines and only one percent of the population will be free and enjoy is that really our future will god really allow us to be blocked from God's source? I don't know. I don't think he he or she would allow that parallel reality to exist, but it is a potential because he wants to have all potentials there to, you know, manifest if that, you know, if he wants or doesn't want to. Like, he wants to experience everything, but... Well, that guy has nothing to do with this conversation. I mean... Well, he's not in control. We are in control because we are it. Yeah, know? exactly. I mean, do we want to live in those conditions? Right. What do we want to experience? We're still driving reality because yeah. he gave us free will to, yeah. to do whatever we want. Yeah, we have to... I think we have to unplug from the media. I mean, we've got to unplug. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to knock it off with the pornography of fear. Mm -hmm. It's a dirty addiction. And I think we all kind of like it. It's like reading a novel, right? I mean, one section, this chapter is really intense. I'm on the edge of my seat the whole fucking time. Mm -hmm. This is what it's like. This sort of same sort of delicious feeling of like, I don't know what's going to happen. I feel stressed. I feel nervous about that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think we kind of like that too because well, we're in this case a, we're in a sci-fi thriller right now well in this case we kind of we kind of are because we've chosen i think from a broad public kind of point of view we've our, i mean our art doesn't challenge us anymore when you look at the vast majority of what's on instagram or what's on netflix or places like that i mean the vast majority of it is entertainment and has nothing to do with real art, some kind of a philosophical or, or a, you know, connecting this point of view, you know, search for the truth. I and mean, most of it's just vapid. And I think we've largely exchanged what feels, what feels, uh, what's what's true for what feels good. You know, I mean, we don't really think about things if. As, as if, if they offend our sensibilities. Right now, people's mechanism, the very mechanism for sense making in the world, has been shattered because we don't know who to trust, and and everything has become so over politicized. Uh, at, at sort of every sort of turn of the corner, as we're existing. So, what happens in that kind of situation is 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 predictable people begin to gravitate towards uh, fear-based messaging and, 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 and ways of thinking about the world and looking at the world that are um, kind of easily manipulated from a mediastic point of view. And so we continue to kind of absorb the fear of COVID, our fear for this invisible virus. We don't quite know what it means. We don't know quite what it is yet scientifically. Um, we don't know how to test for it very well. The tests that are being used are, are rather quite deeply flawed. Mm -hmm. So our statistics around it are, again, totally up in the air. And our early statistics were built on models that were very flawed. And those models continue to be um, referred to actively by the media and sort of by our leadership class who is in itself terrified to do otherwise because of the broad international pressures that they might be facing from organizations like the WHO, which is in itself a fake charity um, and very questionable, very questionable motives. So who cares about COVID? I mean, it's not something, it's not something it's not the issue here. I mean, the issue is a larger economic issue and one of needing to reset uh, kind of the results of where we've come. Um, what we're witnessing is the largest transfer of upward sort of 
upward transfer of wealth and power the world has ever seen into the hands of a very select few. And if those are also the same select few that have the control over the media channels, then we need to really act quite uh, skeptically. We need to think skeptically about what we're hearing, about what these numbers mean, and about what's happening, because in the meantime, most of us are losing all of our shit especially artists who are a very vulnerable, vulnerable group. So I mean, we need to have that conversation, what it means to taking a position against that, because if we don't, then we make the bed we sleep in. We will get something terrible. And, we, and, and, and history tells us that time and time again. Um, we need to do that for no other reason than it is simply the right thing to do is to have that conversation and to say, I just don't agree with that. I don't agree, and I, and, I, and, and, and I put myself, my life, my issues on the line for that in exchange for liberties down the road for my children and my great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really, I think that's what's at stake ultimately, mm -hmm. is saying, you know, we just are at that, this sort of funny period in time when we get to reinvent everything. And reinventing everything with technologies that are so fucking powerful that um, who is in control of those technologies? Is it all? I mean, I think that the world of big data is going to be is is going to far eclipse the the financial rewards of a big oil mm -hmm. that have ever been within the next decade by you know orders of magnitude. You know, the big data of biz, uh, the big business of data. Um, how we track people and all of these things is sort of falling into place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty. That's, a, <laughs> that's pretty dark business. It's okay, man. It, different different artists that I've interviewed have different perspectives. Some don't want to even get into the darkness, and yeah. that's okay because they don't want to live in that vibration of being bumped down. They want to keep on like being happy and spreading the happiness. Everybody's got to have their own attitude and there's no right or wrong. Uh, other people got to, you know, they got their mind and they're intelligent like yourself and they observe it and they see red flags all over the place and they're kind of frustrated and they even talking about it creates conflict in their life and they don't like that. And then I'm making questions being like, but how do we change it? What's the solution? Come on, we're smart people. We got a big heart. And I always got to fall back on my spiritual beliefs that the soul of humanity is God. And it's so big and powerful that it will fix things one way or another. So we don't end up in this techno dystopia. Uh, you know, when I go to the ayahuasca place in my ceremonies and I, and I bow down to ayahuasca and I'm like, ayahuasca the world's a mess it, everything's fucked up and like us artists and normal people we don't have that much power we can complain but nobody cares what do we do and ayahuasca's like dude do you see what i am do you see how big and powerful this is and i run through everything and don't worry about it things will change things will improve it's my nature to evolve back to myself back to god and you will come along it. And sometimes you do have to face negativities, extremes in order to bounce back up to their direction, you know, because that's the lesson you have to learn. You didn't hit your face in the pavement and you're destroying the planet. I'm going to make you f make your face hit the pavement, have a little bit of pain, have a little bit of fear so that you fucking get your act together and start working as humans in the way you should. So I got to keep my faith in just soul that things will get better but thank you for your perspective they're very real it's important that we have these conversations once again because it's foolish to just walk blindly into darkness without preparing ourselves at our plan b's or even having the conversation and saying like you know what i disagree with this and that and these are my reasons and these are the research that i have listened to and i have that right you know, we're in a free country and we're free individuals. We shouldn't judge each other mm -hmm. for having different opinions. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for your perspective. This has been a really great conversation, very interesting. And uh, would you have some final words of wisdom to young artists or humans in general? You know, some last uh, message you'd like to leave us today? Well, I mean, I could say that 
again, was something echoing what I said earlier in relationship to uh, especially those who have the courage to make art. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. I think that's really, um, it takes a tremendous amount of courage, bravery to make art. And uh, it's something that we need very much right now. Uh, not for the fact of needing more art in our lives. I mean, we all got stuff, right? But uh, just the very act of, of creation, the very act of exercising our imagination. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's that tool itself that's going to get us out of this mess. And if we stop thinking imaginatively, if we need to prescribe to the authorities of the dictates of the authority in order to get our news and to shape our, our, our kind of measure of the world, then um, that's one sadly lacking in anything artistic and creative and beautiful and, ex and spiritual expression of that capacity for creation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Let's keep on creating Keep making the world. art. Keep making beautiful art. Yeah. yeah, we create the world by how we imagine it to, you know, where each individual has that power and adds to the vote of what we want to see in it. So the, let's, this whole war or tension in the world right now is a war of information. It's a war of how we perceive our world and how it should be. Every movie that tells us that the future is some kind of apocalypse coming towards yeah. us, it's them telling us that we're going to be their bitches. And us artists like, no, actually, I believe in a utopic world where we all end up happy and spiritually liberated and find what's our passion and we follow it and we you just bring more abundance and respect for mama nature. Ah, humanity's got it. We got this heart. We're love. We're light. We got this. I believe in it. I don't know. I, I can't give up the, the, the optimism that we are going to be at the end of, you know, Return of the Jedi celebrating with the Ewoks, that we defeated this grandiose empire with huge spaceships and em emperors and Darth Vader, and it seemed, you know, like these rebel scum could never do it, but we did it, and we will do it. So thank you for your work. Boom. Thank you for your time. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this interview. If you like this show, please put a like, subscribe, share it. Keep the vibes going. I love you and I'll see you next week. Blessings. Next week, my guest will be Layla is on fire. I've been told by some gallery owners that I need to choose one style and stick to it. I absolutely do not think that's real or necessary. I find that, okay, it's cool to have a certain style, but it gets so boring to do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. It kills the fun process to it. So I feel like every three months, it's okay to recreate yourself. So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks and see you next week. Peace.